Hello, everybody, and welcome to Life Negotiations. My name is Lucine Merabi. I am a professional negotiator, and I'm excited to bring you another former hostage negotiator. Today's guest is the one and only, the one, the only one on earth who holds the title longest standing hostage negotiation team commander with over 33 years of serving the New York City Police Department, NYPD. He has solved more than a thousand crisis situations um, and he is teaching the skills. And one of the things that he teaches, what I'm obviously a fan about is emotions how important emotions are. So can we, for once and for all, stop saying that emotions are not important, be it in hostage negotiation, be it in business negotiations. I can't repeat it enough. Emotions, emotional intelligence is so important for everybody. And because he not only teaches it, but he applies it, the empathy, the listening, the truly being there, the connecting with people, the being authentic, he has gained the nickname Gentleman Jack, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to talk to Jack Cambria. Let's bring him in. Hello, Jack. Jack Cambria, thank you so much for uh, spending this hour with me. I'm delighted to have you on the Life Negotiations podcast. Um, obviously, I know who you are. Every negotiator knows who you are. Um, wow. And I would say everybody in New York knows who you are. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm not sure if that's true, Lucine, but thank you. And thank you for having me on your show. Thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Uh, I'm surprised you would even reach out to me with your reputation uh, worldwide. And oh. you would think of a uh, lonely little old me here in New York City. So, Oh, come on, you. Jack. <laughs> no, Obviously, you. you're a legend for, for, for me and the uh, next generation of professional <laughs> negotiators. For those who don't know you, could you please tell in a nutshell who you are and what you've done that's so impressive? Well, again, thank you for your kind uh, introduction. So uh, my name, as you know, Jack Cambria, I have uh, been with the New York City Police Department uh, with 34 years of service. I'm retired about six years now. And um, <clears throat> I spent a couple of different assignments during those 34 years. I spent 16 of those 34 years without tactical team here in New York City. We call it emergency service. Many across the, uh, the world would know it as SWAT, a SWAT team. So it's a tactical branch of the New York City Police Department. And you would go um, execute uh, high-risk warrants, uh, people who are wanted for very serious crimes, homicides, things like that, very serious assaults. And uh, you know, you'd have the whole you know, uh, garment of uh, ballistic vests on and the helmets and the machine guns and the battering rams and all that. But it was also a, a rescue unit as well. So um, you'd go from one assignment and maybe you go through that door to execute a high-risk warrant to the very next job and maybe taking a cat out of a tree. Hmm. So it's, it was very diversified. It was also a, a, a rescue unit as well. So if somebody saw fit to uh, maybe contemplate suicide and climb up the girder of the Brooklyn Bridge yeah. in New York City, then it would be the emergency service unit that would be tasked with <clears throat> climbing the girder of that bridge and try to convince that individual to come on down onto the roadway and where we would get him or her you know, the assistance that they needed. Mm. to a hospital. My last 14 years with the, uh, with the New York City Police Department, or NYPD for short, was uh, as the commander of the hostage negotiation team. So I had some, some bragging rights that um, uh, I was the longest, and still hold that title, uh, the longest tenured commander of the hostage negotiation team at 14 years, doing it for that long period. Yeah, you started, you started your career, I read, exactly the same year as that I was born. So that was a long oh, time ago. <laughs> 1982, yes. That's it. It's, it's funny you say that, Lucine. Uh, I, um, when I teach classes, I look around the, and the classes, I still teach hostage negotiations across mm -hmm. the country, U.S., and even internationally. But uh, as I look around the audiences, I see that they're getting younger and younger, or maybe I'm just getting older and older. It's probably what it actually is. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so I still kind of spread the word, as you will. Um, and internationally, I, 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 I teach corporate entities, yep. negotiation. So the corporate managers, corporate negotiators. And I think within the... Uh, the uh, principles of negotiation, whether, whether they be police hostage negotiations or corporate negotiations, are mm -hmm. the same. The principles are the same, yeah. minus the violence, of course, on the police side with the guns and the violence. But the principles, which is to very simply put, 
to gain rapport with yep. the individual, establish trust, and then close the deal. Yep. So closing, closing the deal on the police side, I think is maybe having that individual come out to you from that hostile environment so the police do not have to enter into it. Closing the deal on the corporate side is maybe getting a contract signed. Yep. But, but there is a process and it's about, about emotion. Yeah. <clears throat> Man- managing emotion. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Well, I'm so happy you say that because managing emotion is absolutely key. Uh, and I'm glad you st- still spread the word. And that is the way we connected, right? We were supposed to speak at the same event. Unfortunately, yes. that couldn't happen because of oh, travel restrictions so and COVID. <clears throat> and yeah, so I hope we still get the opportunity to speak on the same stage or collaborate. Oh, that would be an gosh. honor, obviously. Oh, for me, indeed. Yes. Yeah. And I was so disappointed about that. All set to come. And then um, we were supposed to speak in Switzerland, yeah. in, in Zurich. Uh, for Matthias. And then last uh, minute cancellation. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, due to travel restrictions into Switzerland. So there will be other opportunities, I'm sure. I hope. I hope so. I hope so. And I can't wait to speak with you about emotions, what you said about how important that is, because we see better, whether that's in professional negotiators or um, in business, there are still people, still leaders who say emotions have nothing to do with it and it's a rational process. Um, and obviously, I don't agree. And I always mix negotiations with emotional intelligence. I think that's where the future is. That's what human behavior, the science is showing it. Mm-hmm. And you having all these decades of experience on the field, you're saying exactly the same things, right? Emotions are super important. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I think the one thing that all negotiations have in common, whether it be on the police side or in the business context, uh, that they are all emotionally driven. So yeah. driven by emotion. So uh even in the corporate boardroom, uh, you know, you might be uh, negotiating a million euro or dollar contract yep. and emotions are high on that. If you, you make a wrong decision and uh, lose out on that contract, emotions are, are, are running high now, you know, might totally. be position in jeopardy. So, and of course on the police side. Um, and I teach that uh, whenever emotions are high, then rationality levels are low. Oh, yeah. And you, and you can't have both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Some people might be able to do that, police officers in particular, because they deal in a highly emotional context. But um, And whenever you make a decision in high emotion, then oftentimes it's a bad decision. Irrational, yeah. Irrational, because it's the rational side is down. So mm-hmm. I think as negotiators, we have to try to manage that emotion and the, those that we're negotiating with. And I'm speaking more from a police context. Um, by lowering it and bringing it down to a more balanced state where rationality and emotion are kind of on a, on a, at a balanced level yep. where now people might be able to consider yep. different options that you may be presenting to them. And, maybe and how do we them. do that? How do you teach your police officers? I mean, you've trained hundreds of uh, law enforcement people. How then? How do they do that? And is everybody able to learn it? I think so. Um, you have to have an innate desire to want to be a negotiator, I think. Um, I don't know if, uh, if people are born born negotiators, but I think it's something that you have to have a, an ability to care enough to want to yeah. do this type of work. It's not for everybody, certainly. Listen, and I cannot tell you how many times we would have somebody on the girder of the Brooklyn Bridge and as cars were passing and they were upset because they were stuck in traffic now, uh, yelling, let him jump. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. So that's not the person we want mm-hmm. as a negotiator, that type of person. But how do you do it? What I teach is that it's not personal. Why would you take it as such? Yeah. Uh, people may be yelling at you and verbally abusing you, but they don't know me as a person. Yep. Uh, I don't know them. So why would I take that personal? And mm-hmm. when I think you remove that element from it, that it's not personal, then you can be more relaxed in your negotiation and let emotions de-escalate. Mm-hmm. I, I like to call it um, the tea kettle analogy. So, you know, mm-hmm. you put a tea kettle with water on the stove um, to boil some water. Yep. Once it gets to the boiling point, steam is released through that little relief valve. If you were to get a cork, for example, and plug up that little relief valve, then in time, yeah. that tea kettle would explode. And explode, yeah. So I think it's the same as people. People have to have a release. Mm. And initially, emotions are running high. And as you allow them to speak, and you are able to listen to what they are saying, emotions are then de-escalating. It's getting out, like the tea kettle, like the steam mm. is getting out. 
Same yep. thing with people. By allowing them to speak and to listen, truly listen. Yeah. Not hear, but listen. Yeah, listen yeah. Between hearing and listening, as you know. But uh, allowing them to speak, it starts to de-escalate emotion. And over mm. time. I will tell you this, and it's just a general statement, saying, but emotion, anger, does have a shelf life. It does dissipate in time. Absolutely. And, and it's not even that long. People think you're going to stay in there forever. But if you truly just are present and caring and listen to that person, what is it? Yeah. An average, I think it's about 90 seconds. Yes, that's right. Uh, in the mind. But what yeah. keeps it going is that we keep reliving that moment and we stay angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but, the feeling you know, we but, give to it and the judgment about it that makes it perfect. go on and on. But if you just perfect. let it be with full acceptance, it's like a minute and a half. It's nothing. Perfect. Perfect. I'm glad you said that. But I have to give one disclaimer to that. Um, seeing, one time I was speaking this lesson and I was teaching a class in Israel. Mm -hmm. I was a negotiation class. And when I said this, that emotion does have a shelf life. So, you know, in other words, the training point was if you be patient and stay in there with that person, it will dissipate. Yeah. And a, a woman in the audience, she had to be, I guess, uh, maybe in her upper 60s, 67, 68 years old. Mm -hmm. She interrupted me respectfully, politely. She goes, excuse me, Jack. It may be true for some that emotion has a shelf life, but she said that for, for others, never. Mm. So obviously she was speaking from experience of a very emotional thing that happened in her, her life, an event, and she never got over it. Yeah, so but that's, that's not an said. emotion then anymore, is it? When we speak about emotions, it's the physiological reaction of the body, which is limited, very limited in time, but then the stories we tell about that emotion then becomes a feeling or a sentiment and that indeed can go on until the rest of our lives yeah i think that's what she was probably experiencing yeah yeah if we don't have the safe space to to fully go through it and to it's it's like the grief cycle right if you don't have the if you don't give it time and the right moment to grieve to fully grieve you can relive the same pain over and over and over again and sometimes for some people it even becomes an identity right we identify to that pain and it gives us a reason to do or not do certain things no excellent and i think that's exactly what the, this woman was going through so mm. but i still remember her telling me that and it did have a kind of profound impact on me by giving that little bit of a disclaimer now yeah well even based on how you deal emotion. with it <clears throat> yeah i think so this thing but obviously, we don't stay 24-7 in that emotion. That's impossible. That's correct. Physiologically. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So you, And I love it that you say that. So you're saying emotions are important. <clears throat> Caring is important. The one who say, let him jump, is obviously not going to become one of our colleagues. But you went even further and you said, I'm going to read. Um, you say, successful negotiators must experience the emotion of love at one point in their life to know what it means to have been hurt in love to know success, and perhaps most importantly, to know what it means to know failure. What has love got to do with it, Jack? I think, you know, um, that comes from uh, when I first took over the hostage negotiation team uh, in New York City. Uh, that was in 2001. Yeah. And, and just as a sidebar, and I'll answer your question in just a second, but the New York City Police Department does have some bragging rights in that it established the very first, very first hostage negotiation team in the oh, entire wow. world. In the entire okay. world, you know, I, I just recently watched a podcast of yours with uh, Gary Nosner, who's mm -hmm. a very dear and close friend of mine. In yeah. fact, uh, I was in the Virginia area last year and teaching, and we met up. It wasn't too far from him. We had dinner, and, and we speak all the time. I just spoke to him a, a couple of weeks ago, actually, on the phone. Yeah, and Gary's was, fantastic. Oh my god, one of my mentors and teachers. He yeah, did so same. much to further um, the field of of hostage law enforcement hostage negotiations. He did. That uh, I always look at him and I still use some of his concepts when I teach. Yeah. And I would tease Gary. Uh, yeah, Gary, the FBI, but it started in the NYPD. And Gary would retort quickly by saying, yeah, Jack, it's true. It did start in the NYPD, but the FBI sent it to Harvard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that is so true. They really, they, and, and, and in particular under Gary's leadership, uh, they brought it to, to a level that, uh, you know, expanded the field of negotiations throughout the entire world. So yeah. many people still teach Gary's concepts. But getting yeah, back absolutely. to Absolutely, and his book is, is <laughs> oh my I, gosh, think, yeah. I think it's right here. Yeah, look, wait a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Always there nearby, ta-da. There you go, no, there you go. And I have Gary a signed Nesner copy of it. Gary Nesner, Stalling for Time. Yeah, 
And I have a signed copy of it as well. Oh, so lucky you. I, lucky I do. You. I do. So, yeah, Gary's a, a very, very dear friend. It's fantastic. I, I spoke to him a few days ago. Yeah. And he continues. Oh he continues to serve, right, and help negotiators oh, and, and spread the he world does. and yeah. continues to give talks. It's amazing. And, and so do you. And, yeah, we're well, really grateful for that. Well, thank you. But getting back to that quote that you just read out of, out of the book I have, and the book is in Italian right now, so I'm yeah. in the process of trying to. I have it, you know, uh, formatted now in, in the English language. Oh. And I just have to, I just have to find a publisher that would be able to publish it. You know, that's well, willing to publish anybody it. listening to this podcast, publisher, <laughs> oh my we gosh, have a yes, fantastic yes. book in Italian. <laughs> it needs to be published in English. Yeah. Many people are waiting for it, so grab oh your opportunity gosh. and reach out to Jack. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. Thank you for that, and uh, yeah, I'll take that. But to get back to the quote, uh, listen, mm -hmm. was. Um, when I first took over the hostage negotiation team, again, in 2001, I started going through uh, a lot of the applications that were on file. The NYPD hostage negotiation team boasts 150 negotiators working mm -hmm. around the clock. Uh, you might be surprised to hear we averaged about, when I was doing it, about 45 assignments per month. Wow. Uh, and that was, of, uh, that was hostage situations, which were mostly domestic in nature. Yeah. Every once in a while, we'd have those bank robbery type movie drama type of negotiations, but mostly they were domestic, which, which rose to a higher level and mm -hmm. the individual would take the other person hostage. Then we had the barricaded situations where a person was by themselves in their apartments or homes. And that was broken down into two categories. First category of the barricaded individual would be the criminal who mm -hmm. was wanted by the police. There was a, an arrest warrant for them. And when the detectives would knock on his, his or her door, they'd barricade, I'm not coming out, I'm not going back to jail, I'll shoot it out with the police before I come out. Okay, negotiators, enter the negotiators and we're gonna talk to you. And then the other classification of barricade was the emotionally disturbed or the mentally ill. Mm. Who are now act, yeah, now acting out in a manner which is dangerous to themselves and they are no longer yeah. responsible for themselves. So now the police, and to the negotiator, once again, must become responsible for them and try to rearrange their thinking process from what they want it to be to what we want it to be. So we're going to talk to, to them as well. Mm -hmm. And then the third category of response was those suicidal jumpers I, I alluded to earlier, climbing up the gird of the Brooklyn Bridge or at the top of a rooftop, yeah. who uh, due to various adverse life conditions decide that they no longer want to live. Mm. They, don't, they don't necessarily want to die, but they just don't want to live that with that yeah, intense, emotional, they, re they rarely, rarely want to die. That's really very rare. Right? I, I remember my suicide, my very first suicide negotiation. It's, and I think we also have now statistics uh, and research saying people who survived from um, an attempt to suicide, almost everybody says, I regret I did it. I'm glad I failed. I didn't want to die. I want the suffering to end, but they don't see any other way. That's right. So, you know, listen, whenever, and I'm deviating a little bit, but, um, and I'll get back okay. to your question. I'll get That's back fine. to your question. But um, whenever we would arrive on the scene of a suicidal potential jumper who hasn't jumped yet, yeah, it's automatically telling us two things, playing to your point. The first thing it tells us, there's a part of them that wants to die today. They're standing on the guard of a bridge or the top of a rooftop. And then the second thing it tells us, there's a part of them that wants to live today. They're standing yeah. on the girder of a bridge. Or and not jumping yet. Or top, and they haven't yeah. jumped yet. So we have at least maybe 1% to start building up. Hmm. I would also hear, you know, have critics of police officers who are non-negotiators and weren't really trained in this area. And they would say, yeah, yeah, if they're still up there, that means they just want attention. They're not going to jump. And I would always be quick to remind them, well, let me tell you this. If you say the wrong thing. They will. You, you just reinforce what they're already feeling. Yeah. And they're going to say, thank you. Thank you very much for reinforcing what I'm feeling. And then yep. they'll put the jump. Mm -hmm. So that's not a true statement whatsoever. But getting back to your question, that quote about um, Love. In, order, yeah, in order to uh, you know, um, know success, you must know failure. Yep. And part of that playing into uh, understanding about love and being hurt in love. So that, where that came from, when I first took over the team, going back again to 2001, I was going through the applications. And I saw, you know, uh, for those who wanted to become negotiators, and at any given time, I probably had about 350 applications on file for maybe, 
maybe 30, 35 positions per year. And mm-hmm. that would be dependent upon how many people would leave the team because there was a staffing yeah. levels of about 150. And when I was going through them, I saw a lot of the, um, the applicants were very young, not only you know, in their age, but also on the job, the, yeah. on the police department. So I decided that uh, I would put a criteria in place that in order to be seriously considered as a negotiator, you had to have at least 12 years experience as a police officer in the NYPD. And there was two reasons for that. The first reason that 12 years, particularly in New York City, we boast a a population of about eight and a half million people. Add to that another 4 million people every single day come into the city for work, for vacation, going to the theater. So approximately 12 and a half million people on average in New York City every single day. Hmm. So with that amount of volume, the candidate with that 12 year experience base would have a very strong foundation in policing. Yep. where they would know intuitively what people might respond to in a positive way uh, or also in a negative way by the things they've said to them in the past. So maybe I shouldn't say that again because mm-hmm. you didn't work with that last person as opposed to let me revisit what I said that last time because that was effective with that person. Yep. So you develop that intuitive sense of what people might respond to. And then the other reason, and perhaps more importantly, is it puts us in a certain age category probably around 35 years or so, give or take, with that level of experience, 12 years with the police department. And probably, probably at 35 years of age, one would know what it means to have experienced the emotion of love at one point in their life, to know what it means to have been hurt in love at one point in their life, to know what it means to know success, and then what it means also to know what it means to know failure. So I believe you must know failure in your life if you hope to know success. Yep. Um, Failure is a pathway to success. And the greater the failure- If you learn from it, right? Thank you. Thank you for that qualification on that. If you learn from it. I think mistakes don't define us, who we are, but they should teach us. So you're right, absolutely. So, um, and the greater the failure that you experience, the greater the life lesson you learned as well, as you so rightly point out, hopefully. And yeah. move on in your life. So and that's, that's what you that, said. That's what you added then to that quote. You said the very good negotiators are the ones with the life stories. Yeah. And that's where experience that's right. comes in. And then through experience, the intuition to, to make decisions quickly in a period where you don't have time and you don't have data and you still have to act. That's where experience comes in. And that indeed you can only gain through going through things and learning from it. Yeah. And by being, by having those life stories at that age grouping. So I guess what I'm suggesting as a sidebar that perhaps a 35 year old or above would be a much more effective negotiator than say that of, a, of an 18 year old. Yeah. Who might not have that same experience base mm. over time. So it so comes down having, to maturity and experience and having hit your head against the wall from time to time so that you really know <laughs> what matters. Perfecto. And, yeah. and that well, is exactly, and, uh, sorry, yeah, continue. No, no, no. I just say I'm just agreeing with you, it's, and that's the perfect point that you're making. Yeah, and that so is the my, perfect bridge to to the whole <laughs> title of my podcast, which is Life Negotiations, uh, where I keep saying, if you know the negotiation skills, you know, be it what you and I both preach about empathy and kindness and listening and and even smiling. I, I heard that you said that as well. Smiling is a more effective strategy than the staring contest. I love that. Right. Yeah. And, and all that, also, why? Because we learn through these things and then we can use it not only on a negotiation table, not only to negotiate, you know, with a criminal or with a business partner, but to negotiate with anybody in life. And then I take it further and say, it can help us negotiate with ourselves and it can help us negotiate with life. When life hits us with an adversity, we can use negotiation skills to be more resilient and to come over it faster and better and stronger. What would be your take on that? Well, I agree. I think um, life confronts us all with an impossible set of demands. Uh, yeah. And life itself is, is a negotiation. You know, mm. it's, it's full with different bumps in the roads and twists and turns. And, we, and around each turn, we don't know what we will find. So I think that's part of it. And as that having those life stories and some life seniority as a negotiator, it puts you in a position to talk to that person 
in my context, on the other side of that door, who's barricaded perhaps or who's holding hostages, where I can say to that person, you know what? I can talk to you about that. Yeah. I know about that. Uh, if somebody is uh, in the, the other side of that door who's contemplating suicide, for example, uh, because of a love that's going wrong, a long time relationship that's broken up. Yeah. I can talk to you about that. Yeah, I've been I there. I know about that. Yeah. Mm. So um, it, it gives credibility to the negotiator and it makes that person, I think, on the other side of that door feel that maybe they are not so very all alone. Mm. Maybe other people have experienced this as well. Yeah. Look at me and I've moved on. And so, yeah, it allows us to connect deeper, right? Because we can relate. It literally happened to me yesterday. Um, I shared the story of my first suicide negotiation on LinkedIn. And within minutes, minutes, I receive a message from somebody who says, I'm writing to you while I'm shivering, you know, my hands. Um, I, you know, I'm fed up with life ever since COVID, et cetera. I've been contemplating suicide. I want this all to end do you have a solution for that? And obviously I started replying immediately and we started talking and I said, I know these dark thoughts. I've been through a burnout. I've been through a depression. She was like, oh, really? And then the conversation continued. So that created a whole other dynamic than me being, hey, I'm the successful negotiator. What are you going through? It, yeah. You connect from human to human when you can share your difficulties. And I have started sharing my difficulties. And as, as many people know, who know who listen to this podcast, I shared the story of my son who has a fatal disease and there is no cure and it's progressive. It's getting worse and worse. So I'm in this constant state of grief and adapt, you know, I have to adapt over and over again. But that makes me a better negotiator on the negotiation table because every day I'm learning to be agile and resilient and manage stress and remain calm and you know, we have more than 100 medical appointments every year, and not even counting the emergencies and the, and, the, and the ambulance rides. So that teaches you a lot about remaining calm, making decisions, um, a love, of course. And would you, you know, one of those hor- hurdles in life, I'm sure we, we all had our fair share. What about you? Have you ever faced something that was really difficult and your negotiation skills helped you go through it? Well... If I think I had to pick one single most thing, because uh, I, I probably like most have a lot of debris on my beach, you know, mm. uh, a lot of things going on over my life uh, that uh, I had to deal with. If I had to just maybe pick one out of you know, one of those pieces of debris, I, I think it had to do involving uh, a love, you know, a mm-hmm. deep, deep love. And um, I still still think about it now. That uh, just didn't work out after a whole period of time, you know, and it didn't work out. And uh, it still uh, impacts on me, you know, so I still think about that. So by having lived through that and going through that, very, it, for me, it was a difficult time in my life. I can now talk to others that I've been there. And I can talk yeah. to you about that, you know. You know, this thing, I ask every class that I do, and I teach probably 30 weeks a year. Uh, around the country, around the U.S., and also, you know, the last couple of years, no, because of uh, COVID, but even internationally. Mm-hmm. But I ask every class that I start, the first question after I do my introductions and all that is who in this class has never had a problem in their life? There's not no adversity. Please raise your hand. Yeah, nobody. And of course, nobody can raise their hand. And I would suggest anybody listening to this podcast and hearing this question as well, would not be able to raise their hand because we know all know adversity. Yeah. And the reason I posed that question early on in the week, you know, the first, first question I posed early in the morning on the first day is to set the tone for the rest of the week of training mm. for negotiators. So by understanding that you too know adversity in your life, when you now respond on an incident as, as a negotiator, you can now maybe have some level of compassion and empathy for what they might be going through because you too have been there. Yeah. And it's kind of sets the tone, yeah. Totally, totally. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Obviously, that's still impacting you to this day and helps you connect with people who also go through that and have a bit more compassion for people who do things that you and I would never do, Hmm. but out of the same pain. And that's where we connect with. I mean, I've moved on, you know, of course, and uh, but it's something that's always going to be near and dear to me, so... 
But thank you for asking. So well, thank you for it sharing. Helps. It takes sometimes courage. It helps to talk. Yeah, I appreciate that. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you also say this thing, and um, I had to laugh when I when I read it. But you say in a negotiation, we have to create a mutual enemy. What's that about? Actually, I uh, I try to discover that. It's called the mutual enemy approach. Mm -hmm. The mutual enemy approach, the philosophy behind it is that the enemy of my enemy, if you're the enemy of my enemy, you're my friend. Yeah. Right? So in other words, uh, seen, uh, you and I, uh, if, if you don't like, I'm in a negotiation with you, for example, for whatever it might be, and uh, you tell me, I don't like my boss. Now, you might ex be expecting me to say, oh, yeah, your boss, he sounds like a real jerk. So I'm agreeing with you. So now you're my friend because I'm the enemy of your enemy, your mm -hmm. boss. All right. So I discovered that actually in, in negotiation work, police hostage negotiations in particular, because it's putting the negotiator in a position where they are being judgmental against the third party or issue that you might be upset against. Mm -hmm. And as, as negotiators, uh, particularly hostage negotiators, we have to remain neutral yeah. and, and just let the individual speak and listen. So I, I, I kind of discouraged the common enemy approach is what it's called. So Interesting. And how can we apply that in business? Is it applicable? I think, I think it's the same. You know, um, if uh, you know, the other negotiator, uh, the other party that you're negotiating with has a particular issue, uh, it's something you can explore, certainly, and mm -hmm. talk about. But don't uh, put yourself in a position where you will become judgmental against somebody else or, or an issue. Yeah but rather listen to what their con concerns are and then have a conversation about it. Yeah, it's just a, another way to bond and relate and connect. Yeah. I'll give you a I, I, I can see how that works definitely in politics. Oh <laughs> You're my right. gosh, yeah. yeah. Right, and, and in diplomatic negotiations. Officers, yeah, and police officers get in a lot of trouble with this because as police officers, when they're working as police officers, are supposed to be apolitical. Yep. In other words, not having any one particular candidate that they speak about. I mean, they can do that when they're off, off duty, but not while they're doing it. But mm. some get in trouble with that. And to give you a quick example, I was doing a, um, um, a negotiation training about, about two years ago. It was in Virginia. And uh, we were doing uh, on role play scenarios where I had somebody in another room playing hostage takers. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a brand new negotiator was on the phone trying to negotiate with this hostage taker who was a, another police officer. Um, the hostage taker says to the new negotiator on the phone, yeah, my wife, she's a real... Mm -hmm. So the negotiator, <laughs> the B word, <laughs> he says, yeah, she sounds like a real B word. Ooh. Right? <laughs> and before I can stop it, because that's the common enemy approach. I know what he was trying to do. He was Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he went too far. <laughs> but he went too far. So the person on the phone, the person playing the hostage uh, taker, he's a, he was an experienced negotiator. He jumped all over. He goes, hey, wait a minute. I can call my wife B. Yeah. But you, but you can't. <laughs> So uh, then I stopped it and we spoke about it and he, he got the, he got the message. Yeah. Was, yeah there's a limit. <laughs> yeah. And that was the common enemy approach. He was trying to gain rapport with the individual, but at the same time being judgmental against the third party or mm -hmm. issue that the hostage taker was upset about. It's not the approach to take. So. Yeah. Yeah. So do it within limits. <laughs> you got within it. limits. You got but it. I see it here in the, in the Middle East, obviously this approach is very much working, be it a certain country, be it a certain religion, then all the other ones who don't have that become friends and and, and make yeah. things happen. So that approach definitely works. Hmm. I'll try to see how I can use that in business. That can be a good one. <laughs> yeah. I haven't used that one. And yet. you bring up a you bring up a great point there. Um, the one great thing about operating out of New York City is that it's the melting pot, as we call it. So there's yeah. every ethnicity and religion and ethnic background, all in New York City. And as negotiators doing this for any period of time, you pretty much come across every single culture. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an interesting and important to understand, at least have a little understanding about different cultures. Different cultures, of course. And here, of course, it's exactly the same in Dubai. Yeah. You have only about 10, 15% Emiratis and the rest is global. The entire world comes yeah. together, yeah. all the so countries, the all the religions. And, um, and that is why, that, that's one of the reasons I love this place because I finally feel at home. Because I was, I'm, I'm Armenian, born in Iran, raised in the Netherlands, grew up in France. <laughs> now I live here. I have four passports. I don't have one home. You know, I don't have one home. My home is the world and it's 
you know, whatever I wow. feel like that day. So that is why Dubai is fantastic. And I'm sure New York would be great as well. I haven't been there yet, unfortunately. Oh, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting I'll for let you know when I come to New York. <laughs> Indeed. So you must speak uh, several different languages? Listen. Yeah, I speak five languages. I have a problem with English. I speak a great, a great Brooklyn I can speak, but uh, English is a little bit of a problem for me. So. Do you still speak Italian? No, I, I really don't. I have some very limited vocabulary, a very limited vocabulary uh, with French. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife is French, so I have oh. some, some, uh, some, just some words, not even a vocabulary. Un petit peu. Say, but, un petit peu. <laughs> so, um, but uh, the book, uh, I can't even read my own book, to be honest with you. That's an Italian. So uh, just very briefly how that book came about. Uh, Palais Monet, it means uh, loosely uh, speak to me. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. You're so, talk to um, me. Talk to me. Mm. So um, that came about because I do a lot of teaching in, in Italy. And this one particular company that I, I teach for, it's called Performance Strategies. The owner of it also has a publishing company as well. And he saw the need that I have to write a book, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, my my experiences. So I, I wrote the book on, on, on my presentation, my curriculum that I teach, and a lot of the lessons that are there, and I put it into practical sense as well. So that's how that book came about. And now also why I'm in the position of trying to, you know, I just, I just formatted it into the English language and enhanced it greatly as well. So uh, Fantastic. Yeah, I can't out. wait to read that. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that will happen. Yeah. I had a call this afternoon with somebody who might be able to help. Let me reach out to ah. him. Yep. I want to write okay. a book too, but oh, you should. I, I have you so many have much... stories in my head. I don't even oh, know yeah. which angle to take or, you know, which, which book. And I know I love writing. So I know myself, once I start writing a book, it's going to be like one book every year. You know, then I'm going to become a oh, book you machine. Must. <laughs> you must. You must. And you know, it just memorializes uh, what your passion is uh, to the world. And yeah. those that... Mostly negotiators will find, uh, you know, an extra space in it. So, so you must, I encourage you the same, to do this. Well, the only reason I haven't done it, and, and maybe it's an excuse, but it's also the, the real truth, is that the thing I'm most passionate about that I would really like to share is obviously the disease of my son and how that impacted and how people can turn adversity into inspiration. But that would mean then that I have to describe what it is. And my son is 10 now. He loves reading. So obviously, if I write the book, he's going to read it. And yeah. then he will find out that it's a fatal disease, that there's no cure. And that is something I haven't told him yet. So I don't want him to find out in my book. That's the excuse I'm uh, using yeah. for now. But yeah, obviously, one day I have to tell him. I've told him, of course, that he has a disease and there's something wrong with his muscles and that you know doctors are trying to find something. But I haven't told him you're going to die young if they don't come up with something. So. Oh my God. So yeah. thoughts and prayers being sent to you right now. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. My heart is with you. Oh, well, this is a, such a wonderful conversation and I could talk to you for hours. I have so many questions, <laughs> but I'm aware of your time that I will respect. Oh, I'm um, fine. I'm fine. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, one final question, because obviously looking back, you have all these decades of experience. Have you seen something shift in the professional negotiation world? Have you seen the way we negotiate change and how would you pull that to the future? What would you say the future negotiator must be like, must do, um, must apply? I don't, from the time I've been involved with this, um, the only real changes I have seen is more in the field of, of technology mm -hmm. and how we look to approach that, how we can get our voice into a room and I'm talking more on the police side of that. Uh, technology has definitely changed. There's, uh, we even have robots now that we can insert into a location where we can negotiate through the robot. You know, so yeah. a police officer doesn't have to be in there where it could be very dangerous. So more in the field of technology. But I think the principles, um, I think um, hostage negotiation principles are at the core of crisis intervention. Yeah. Whether they be on the police side or on the corporate side. So it, the principles uh, that must be uh, respected and maintained. And understanding that um, what is important to somebody must be deemed as important, whether or not it's important to the negotiator. Yep. But if it's important to that person, it, it requires and deserves that specialized attention. That is important. Mm -hmm. It's not important to me, but it's important to you. So let's, let's talk about it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with somebody's position, 
or perception, but just that you're able to talk about it and open mm-hmm. up and have a conversation. Perceptions can be very dangerous uh, if you let them get away from you. Uh, we all perceive the world a little differently. We can look at the same exact problem, yep. but yet see it from a different perspective, different point of view. So it's important that the negotiator doesn't allow themselves to think that their truth, or their perception is the only it's truth. The only truth, yeah. Because that's quite simply arrogance. Yep. And arrogance is a, you know, a, is a kind of disguise for insecurity. Mm. So the negotiator must be open-minded, willing to accept other points of view, even though they may be uncomfortable and accept uncomfortable emotions sometimes in order to get through the, through the uh, negotiation. And remembering, said it earlier on, it's, it's not personal. You know, it's yeah. not personal. So that might but that's be. where humility comes in then. If you can have this humble approach of saying, you know, my truth is not the truth. Um, and whatever you tell me is based on your perception of the way you see the world. And therefore, it's not personal. And therefore, you can insult me. That's okay. I'm still going to be there and let you talk and let you vent and let you speak and label your emotions and be there for yeah. you and create this... I, I spend a week with George Corizer. He's absolutely amazing as well. And he goes even further. He goes until uh, grief in the corporate, huh? saying leadership, uh, it's important that we talk about grief, that we talk about loss, that we talk about bonding, because that's all what we all go through. And that's when humility comes in and knowing how to um, push away your ego to truly be with somebody. And and that's how we connect. And um yeah, it was fascinating working with him and under his mentorship. Uh, and I thought, yeah, we can we can pull. I mean, emotional intelligence is one thing, and it's super important, and it's getting more important. And in the corporate, we see that now it's sure. it's, it's it's becoming the next thing, and I'm really happy about that. And we can pull that even further. I mean, I'm yawning for the day where we can, in a corporate setting, and even with hostage negotiators, sit down and talk about grief. Wouldn't that be fascinating? Yeah. And you think about it, you know, the negotiators have to be salespeople as well. Police negotiators have to sell jail time to people that we're negotiating with sometimes. You know, we have to put a positive spin on jail that mm. will enable them to come out and be arrested. So sometimes not so easy to do, yeah. but um, you have to be creative and flexible in, I think, your approach to negotiations. Absolutely. What it might come down to, yeah. Yeah, that's why there's still so much to do. The other day I was talking to somebody who wants to be a negotiator who says, Luz, what should I do? I said, whatever you do, just join us because we need more negotiators. We need people to teach this. We need. I mean, I'm so passionate about it because I truly believe we make the world a better place when we negotiate better. If you think about it, be it in politics, business at home, divorces, how many conflicts, you know, how often can we solve conflict faster, better if we know how to do it? Right. And you have to admit, Jack, I'm sure that the, the easiest negotiations you had in your life were with other negotiators. Yes or no? I think so. You know, <laughs> I, I, I teach something and I, I don't I know you have time restraints and I'll be very. Yeah, OK, that's one. Um, I know that, you know, uh, I teach uh, the three. There's basically three responses to stress and you would know what they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to call them the three F's. Yeah, there's, there's uh, the first one is fight. The first fight. F is fight. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a physical fight. It could be a verbal altercation. Mm-hmm. Um, the second response is to flight. Uh, the flight, right? Mm-hmm. The, I don't want to deal with you anymore. I'm out of here. And then the third one is to freeze. Yeah. I, I liken that to maybe the deer coming out on the roadway at nighttime, uh, mm-hmm. rural road, uh, cars coming out of the headlights, they freeze. They don't know how to respond coming right yeah. at them. And they get by the car. Mm-hmm. I like to suggest that a fourth response. Those are mostly unproductive responses to stress. Mm-hmm. If I can suggest the fourth one, fourth F, which is to face, face mm, it, go all in front it, and ask about it. Um, you know about active listening skills. Um, one of those are emotional labeling. Yeah. Label the emotion, sir, madam. You seem upset. Mm. What's what's the matter? And mm. you would probably get a response to that. Well, you're damn right, I'm upset. But yeah. that's okay because you just got them to agree with you. Yeah, you just connected. Anything? And <laughs> even if they say I'm not upset at all there's still a connection because they then what is it that you feel? That's right. And you ask the next question. There you go. So, yeah. so, um, yeah. So, so again, face, I yeah. It- you know, I, I have, I have another F that I use to, to break the ice as well is the F from flirt because trying to keep the peace 
is also a stress response is also saying, oh, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. You know, it, it, it's a mix between freeze and flight. But people pleasing, I, I like that. <clears throat> people pleasing, it can be as dangerous as, as the other reactions because you, you don't say anything. You boil it up, you boil it up. And then one day you explode. And then you're like, well, I don't know how I reacted that way. I don't know why I said what I said. Well, because you didn't say it for all these 13 years before. So this is how it comes out. And this so is what like we see that. in family gatherings, right? And I call that the F of flirt, where you don't agree, but you don't want to say it for the sake of keeping the peace. And there was this beautiful quote that I read. I don't remember who said it, but she said, it was a best-selling author, a woman. She said something in the lines of, be careful that when you are trying to keep the peace, you're not, in fact, starting a war inside yourself. And I thought that was beautiful. That is, that's very interesting and beautiful as well. So you are my teacher as well, Asin. So thank you. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to help you get that book published because I want to read oh, what's in there. And I don't speak Italian. So. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I don't, I can't read it. So, I, but thank you. So and we're going to make just, it happen. Just, yeah, I appreciate that. And I love the, the fact that you're doing these podcasts. Uh, I like to say to my classes, I teach my classes to learn my classes. So mm -hmm. each time I, I teach a class, somebody comes out with a gem that I now use. So I'm going to use uh, your flirt now uh, <laughs> analogy as well, if you don't mind. Go uh, ahead. Now you have a fifth you, F. <laughs> I, I will give you a credit for it. Yeah, there you go. So thank yeah, you. well, if you, if you really want to take it further, I even have other Fs because the, the, the flirt can then transform into the other F, the real F word, and that's where the Stockholm syndrome comes in and stuff. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> oh, all right. And you F see, also stands for uh, feelings, right, as well. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> the F word where so many people and corporates are afraid of and that you yeah. and I are changing here and saying the F word is very useful, the feelings <laughs> in negotiations, in leadership, in everything to resolve conflict. All right, Mr. Jack Cambria, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Well, thank you um, so much. I will write the name of your uh, website, jackcambria.com, somewhere around this video so that people can find you, can reach out to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a contact page on that. So uh, I'd probably yeah. respond back to anybody that cares to, to contact me. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, decades of experience. If you want to learn about negotiation, Jack Cambria is your man. Reach out to him. And I hope you and I will be on the same stage one day. Um, oh yes it's a dream yeah so uh, okay. and i'm waiting for you in new york city as well yeah i might plan that in the <laughs> summer though <laughs> oh yeah no it's too cold now although it's beautiful at christmas time but uh yeah well dubai's fantastic cold. so if you want to you know uh, if i ever get there i'll be uh escape the cold well. come here especially now with the expo it's fantastic okay yeah, jack amazing. thank you so so much um it was a pleasure talking to you um and yeah i will let people reach out to you if they want to. And I can't thank you enough for this conversation and that you continue to serve the community of negotiators of the law enforcement, but also corporate and everybody else who wants to learn about negotiation. Thank you very much for your work, sir. Thank you, Lucy. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening and see you next time for a new episode. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, everybody.